Atari recently turned 50. June 27th of this year to be exact. So I'm going to be taking you on a journey that spans all those years. Just a quick note, I will not be going over failed Atari projects like the Cosmo or the 2700 or deep diving into all company details. I will be covering the history of what actually made it into the market and all the twists and turns the Atari brand has gone through over the years. With that said, sit back, grab some popcorn, and let's start this crazy ride. Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney had met in 1968 while working at Ampex in San Francisco. Nolan had pitched to Ted a few ideas he had after working part-time in an amusement arcade years earlier. What if they could create a game and an overall business model that would include coin-operated games? In 1969, they formed a company called Syzygy created a prototype clone of the game Space War and called it Computer Space. Nolan then shopped around and ultimately, Nutting Associates agreed to manufacture the game. The wheels were now in motion. Unfortunately, Computer Space was not the breakout hit Nolan and Ted had hoped for. It sold well, but Nolan thought that it could have been better had Nutting marketed it properly. Nolan also thought that the game was just too complicated and needed to come up with a simple game. Something that any bar drunk could pick up and play. Wow, free beer! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Buddy, those are my quarters! They left Nutting Associates in search of a bigger manufacturer. In 1972, they learned that the name Syzygy was taken and had to find a new name for their fledgling company. Nolan was a big fan of the Chinese board game Go and decided on using the name Atari, which was a reference to a strategic positioning on the Go board game similar to that of Checkmate in chess. With their new company now firmly set, they decided to set up offices in Sunnyvale, California where they came under contract with Bally Manufacturing to create a driving game. It was during this time that they had hired Alan Alcorn. Nolan had been enamored with the game Speedway from when he worked in the amusement arcades so many years back and it had never left his memory. He wanted to create a driving game similar to that one. But after attending a demonstration of the Magnavox Odyssey, Bushnell decided that he would make the tennis game into a coin-up version. But first, he needed to use a little trickery. He told Alcorn that he had a contract with General Electric to create a product. A game with some moving paddles, some digits to keep score, and one moving spot. Bushnell was not sure on Alcorn's ability to create a game, so he made this project sort of a test run for his abilities. Alcorn did not disappoint. His prototype was so impressive, Bushnell and Dabney decided to try it out on a local bar called Andy Capps Tavern. Thus, Pong was born on November 29, 1972. This game was an improvement over the Odyssey counterpart in so many ways. The paddles were smaller, the area of play was much larger, and digits up top kept the players aware of the score. Atari had found its jackpot. The game was a huge hit. However, things were not all celebratory behind the curtains. Bushnell and Dabney had a falling out, and on March of 1973, Dabney left Atari, selling his portion of the company to Bushnell for $250,000. Atari had its hit. Now, it needed a logo. Atari needed an iconic logo, something to set them apart. Bushnell hired George Opperman, who would go on to design the Atari logo we all know. And in 1973, it made its first appearance on the arcade game Space Race. Atari had a hard time during 1973 in keeping up with demand for Pong. This allowed other companies to release clone versions during this time. By 1974, Atari was having financial troubles. They quickly tried to expand globally specifically Japan. They got a lukewarm reception, to put it mildly. Ron Gordon, vice president of international marketing, was able to fix their business roadblocks. 
Atari sold off Atari Japan in 1974 to Namco for $1.8 million. This deal gave Namco exclusive rights to distribute all Atari games in Japan and it gave Atari, in general, some breathing room financially. The release of the arcade Tank in November of 1974 was a huge boost for the company as well. Fending off bankruptcy for the time being, Bushnell set his eyes on the home console market. But then it came time to do Consumer Pong. And uh, everyone says, well, you know, it was, boy, what a great idea. So I figured, okay, I'll do Consumer Pong. I'll show them. We'll see how far we get with this thing. We'll bankrupt the company. Because I mean, how are we going to do? We had to, how could we launch a consumer product with nothing? We had no backing, no equity. They eventually found a distributor in Sears, and Atari agreed to deliver 150,000 Pong home units by 1975. The Pong system was rebranded as the Sears Telegame, and it was a hit that holiday season. Atari now had a strong foothold on both the arcades and homes. But Bushnell wanted Atari to stay in the forefront of innovation. As early as 1973, he had planned for a home system, but due to the high prices of microprocessors, it was not a feasible option at that time. But in early 1976, MOS Technology released the 6502, a microprocessor that had enough under its hood to do what Atari had in mind. The company hired Joe Decor, hope I pronounced that correctly, and J Minor to develop the hardware for the new console, codename Stella. The name Stella was chosen since it was the name of the bike that Joe Decor rode to work. But Bushnell and Atari needed some cash infusion to further develop this new console. Atari took an acquisition from Warner's Communications for $28 million in November of 1976. With this, Atari was able to push ahead in development on the Atari VCS, and it was released in September of 1977. Attention shoppers, the new Atari cartridge game is in. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh-oh, George again. <laughs> Atari's air speed battle. It comes with 27 games, but that's just for starters. You can get nine cartridges, 187 games. Ooh, blackjack. <laughs> oh. I'd like an Atari. Sorry, only our demonstrators left. Fine. No, George. Mine. The new video computer system by Atari. More games, more fun. The company was able to sell 400,000 units, but still lost money due to production issues that caused many units to be delivered to retailers late after the holidays. During this time, as a small trivia note, Atari also released the Atari Video Music, a unit that took audio input and created graphical displays of that audio into a monitor. It doesn't get more 70s than that. Not surprising, the unit did not sell well and by 1978, it was discontinued. So up until now, Bushnell had kept a pretty laid-back working atmosphere at Atari. You could work in jeans and t-shirts, you could smoke weed, you could party hard. It was a company with heavy emphasis on leisure. No deadlines to meet, it was basically a young programmer's dream to work for such company. Warner Communications saw things differently. So much so that they decided to bring in Ray Kassar to be president of Atari's consumer division. His managerial approach was a total 180 of what Atari had been accustomed to all the years under Bushnell. But this is exactly what Warner Communications had in mind. They needed Atari to be a more professional business type atmosphere and not a sorority house approach that they were known for. You could say conflicts would soon arise and eventually boil over to the point where shit hit the fan. Uh, Warner Communications took over, all of a sudden it became this big corporation. This is the way you're going to work, you have to wear suits, you have to come at this time, you have to leave at this time. Atari, under Nolan Bushnell, its motto was innovative leisure. <laughs> under Warner, it was, we're the Atari VCS company, and that's a big difference. In November of 78, Nolan Bushnell, the man who had co-founded Atari, started the arcade revolution and brought home consoles to the mainstream consumer, was fired from the very company he started six years earlier. 
The very next year, Ray Kassar took the position of CEO and began implementing changes across the board. During his tenure as CEO, Kassar was known to describe his engineers as high-strung prima donnas. This became a running joke within the company, but not everybody was laughing. His inability to take programmers and the engineers seriously was also an issue that caused a big rift between regular employees at Atari and upper management. This was never more evident than when looking at Atari profits from the gaming division. The company was making huge sales off certain Atari titles, yet those programmers saw very little compensation for their hard work and creativity. Four programmers, David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead, noticed that their games were accounting for more than half of Atari game profits. They met with Ray Kassar in May of 1979 and demanded to be financially compensated as well as have their names be visible on the games they had created. This is the meeting where Ray Kassar made one of the most famous quotes in the history of video games. You are no more important to that game than the guy on the assembly line who put it together. Not surprisingly, the four programmers left the company in August of that same year, intent on starting their own gaming company. Their new business venture would become the first third-party publisher in the gaming industry. The name of this company? Activision. In that same year, the original team behind the creation of the VCS were set to release a successor to the VCS. Initially back in 1977, the team knew that the VCS had a lifespan of about 3-4 to four years. They had been at work on coming up with a unit that would be available to take over the VCS once that time frame was up. All their work culminated in the creation of the Atari 400 and the 800 computers, both of which launched in 1979. This was the start of the Atari 8-bit computer lineup. Atari's attempted to break into what was at that time a still very young and mostly untapped computer market. Bought a home computer, huh? An Atari 800 home computer. Nothing but the best for my son. Why Atari? Uh, Atari makes computers that, you know, seem friendly, part of the family. Want to show off? Sure. They're real easy. Terrific software, huh? Nice graphics. Now, how do you like this for sound capability? Impressive. It sure is. So what's his first project? Soon, the alphabet. A is for airplane. Atari home computers. Only Atari puts so much in it for you. But Atari was not doing well. Even though the VCS was selling, it was not flying off the shelves. Through 1979, the VCS had only sold maybe a million copies, and the 8-bit computers were having a hard time competing with the likes of Apple, Tandy, and Commodore. Atari needed a home run. So in 1980, Atari struck a deal with Taito to create a home version of the smash hit Space Invaders, which had been setting the arcades on fire back in its native land of Japan. The deal was a success. Out here we entertain ourselves at home. So we got an Atari video game. There's so many different games to play. We especially like Space Invaders. Zapping those little devils from outer space. It's fun. But personally, I think the whole idea of creatures from outer space is a little far-fetched. No other company offers you as many different video game cartridges as Atari. Atari VCS sales went from 450,000 sold in 1979 to about 1 million in 1980. Atari and the video game industry had their first ever killer app. But even though sales were looking up, morale inside of Atari was continuing to decline. More Atari game programmers were leaving and creating their own companies in hopes of becoming another third-party publisher for not only Atari, but other consoles such as the Intellivision. iMagic was another third-party publisher helmed by ex-Atari employees that was created in 1981. And they would go on to create some truly memorable titles such as Cosmic Arc, Atlantis, and Riddle of the Sphinx, to name a few. They had some of the coolest looking box art and colors when compared to the standard VCS game box. In 1982, with Atari having a strong home presence and comfortable lead on its closest competitor, the Intellivision, 
they snagged the rights to bring Pac-Man to the home market. This title would become the best-selling VCS game and help push sales of over 10 million units alone in 1982. But the horrible conversion of the game left a bad taste in the mouth of many consumers. Confidence across the gaming industry was being lost. In that same year, Atari released the 5200. Made up of the same technology from the Atari 400 and 800 computers, it was supposed to be released a couple of years prior as the true successor to the VCS. But management had a different idea and decided to repackage that technology as computers so that Atari could enter that market back in 1979. Alongside the release of the 5200, Atari renamed the VCS the 2600 in order to align the branding of their consoles. The waning confidence consumers had about Atari came back to hurt them and the sales of the 5200. If you think ColecoVision plays all Atari cartridges... You mean it can't? Here's Pac-Man on ColecoVision. But here's Pac-Man for the Atari 5200 Super System. Now you're talking. And it doesn't work on ColecoVision. But won't their adapter? It won't play Super System cartridges. Not pole position? Not this pole position. Not centipede? Not this centipede. Only on the Atari 5200 Super System. But aren't they hard to find? They're everywhere. Everywhere? The Atari 5200 Super System. They were once again releasing a product to the market that felt underpowered and behind the times. But sales of the 2600 were still holding steady and so in 1982, Atari must have felt that acquiring the rights to E.T. would do for the 2600 what Space Invaders and Pac-Man did in the past. And it got to the point where Atari's attitude was, we put anything out, it's going to sell. Great, send I don't know how many million dollars to Spielberg for the name. What? Once again, without going into much details, E.T. failed to meet all expectations. It was a critical and financial failure. By 1983, with rising inventory stock, loss of consumer confidence, the 5200 and the Atari computers barely making a dent in their markets respectively, the company was in trouble. Warner Communications said today that its once booming Atari business lost another $180 million in the third quarter for total losses this year of more than half a billion dollars. Ray Kassar had recently been investigated for insider trading in 1982 and its competitors were eating away at Atari's market share. Ray Kassar finally resigned from CEO of Atari in July of 1983 amid all the mounting issues. Warner quickly replaced him with James Morgan, an executive from Philip Morris. In turn, he quickly laid off thousands of employees and also transferred thousands of other positions overseas in an attempt to reduce cost across the board. But Atari was still bleeding money. So towards the end of 1983, they started to clear out tons of unsold inventory by transporting them to a landfill in New Mexico and burying tons of game cartridges and other products in Alamogordo. Atari's quick descent into red ink reverberated across the gaming industry. Eventually this, coupled with other factors I won't get into here, cascaded to other manufacturers and gaming studios to the point of causing the video game crash of 1983. By the end of that year, shares for Atari had gone from $60 to $20 per share. Warner quickly started searching for a way out. Warner sold the consumer products division of Atari to Jack Tramiel in 1984. This sale included the console and computer production, game development, and Atari Soft divisions. He merged them into his own business and rebranded them under one title, Atari Corporation. Warner, meanwhile, stayed with the arcade portion of the business and some other assets and renamed this division to Atari Games. Part of the deal was that the word games always accompanied the Atari logo and that Atari games could not use the Atari brand on the home market side. Jack Tramiel had recently left Commodore but his impact on the computer industry could not be ignored. He had led Commodore from a small startup computer company to one with billions in sales by the time he left them in 1984. 
He felt he could do the same now that he had the Atari computer product line under his belt. Atari Corporation nearly froze all projects that were currently under works. One of the victims of this decision was the Atari 7800, which was announced on May of 84. Atari Tail, which was another division being worked on, was set to create video home phones for the market under the Atari brand and was also scrapped and sold off to Mitsubishi. Years later, that telephone technology would be released under the Luma brand name. Tramiel tried to push the Atari 8-bit computers with the creation of the XE computers and the introduction of the Atari ST in 1985. The ST was marketed as the successor to the 8-bit Atari lineup and had slightly beaten the Amiga to its launch. However, Tramiel had achieved a somewhat sour reputation as head of Commodore back in the days and many developers and game designers were skeptical and hesitant in jumping in to support the ST and the new Atari computers. In the next few years, you had Atari release not only the ST and XE lineup, but now they added the XL, which in itself included the 600 XL, 800 XL, 1200 XL, 1400 XL, and in case this wasn't enough, let's add the 1450 XL. The XE lineup included the 65 XE and 130 XE, as well as the XE game system, which is basically a 65 XE model with a detachable keyboard. You can get an understanding as to how confusing this would have been to the general computer consumer back in those days. Nowadays, you have the internet and YouTube for quick and instant research. Back then, you had to go to a bookstore or a magazine rack and pick up a computer magazine and hopefully, you will be able to see a review of one of the hundreds of Atari computers or other computers that you might have been interested in at that time. Worst yet, imagine buying any of these models and then next week come to find out Atari is coming out with a newer one in a few months. Now you can see why consumer confidence on Atari was almost non-existent. Oh yeah, by the way, the Atari 7800 would be released in 1986. A console that should have been released back in 84, but was rather just held in warehouses because of the Warner sale and Tramiel's dedication to the computer division, is finally released to slight consumer interest. Don Mallard, captain of the U.S. video game team. When I'm not going to high scores in the arcades, I'm home playing games on my Atari 7800. As an expert, I like the 7800 because there are great arcade hits like Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong Jr. Adventure games like Impossible Mission, sports games like Hat Trick and Real Sports Baseball, action games like Desert Falcon and Karateka, and the 7800 plays all the 2600 games. As a consumer, I like the 7800 because most games cost under 20 bucks. The Atari 7800, the choice of the experts. Even with backwards compatibility and a lower price tag than its competitors, it barely makes a dent to the ever-growing Nintendo empire. All in all, the 7800 would only sell 3.7 million units during its lifespan. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atari aisle, Time Warner's Atari Games division had continued creating iconic arcade games and soon turned their attention towards making video games for the popular Nintendo Entertainment System. But due to contractual obligations, they could not do so using the Atari name. Thus, Tengen was born, and their relationship with Nintendo was complicated at best. The two sides would go back and forth time and again in various lawsuits all the way through the early 90s. In mid 1994, Time Warner would consolidate Tengen, Atari games, and Time Warner Interactive into one division, the Time Warner Interactive Banner. More on them later on. Atari Corporation in the meantime once again tried a run at the console side, but this time the handheld market. Two former Amiga employees by the name of RJ Mikau and Dave Needle left their pairing company for Epix, where alongside David Morse designed the Handy Game, a handheld system capable of playing cartridge games. But they needed funding. They ultimately went to Sega and Nintendo but were turned down. 
They eventually found a partner with Atari. The deal was that Epix would handle the software side while Atari took care of the hardware side. Epix, however, filed for bankruptcy before the handheld could be released, and all responsibility fell on Atari. They renamed the device the Lynx and released the color handheld to the market a few months after the Game Boy on September 1989. Hey, Mr. Block, can I go to the bathroom? Two minutes. Introducing Lynx from Atari, the color video game you can get away with. Well, sometimes. Small trivia here, Atari had to purchase Amiga computers in order to program games for the Lynx. They could not do this on their own Atari computers. Even though the Lynx is a great piece of hardware showcasing some amazing technology for that time, most games are made by Atari themselves with little third-party support something that would ultimately cause the Lynx to fail and fall far behind the likes of the Game Gear and the Game Boy. The Lynx would sadly be discontinued by 1995. In total, the Lynx goes on to sell just 3 million units. Another possible cause of their Lynx failing could have been due to Atari slowing all marketing and support for the Lynx as early as 1992, as they were preparing to enter the home console market once more. As early as 1988, Atari had started working on a console that would be the successor to the 7800 and an entry to the 16-bit market. This project was spearheaded by Flare Technology, a UK computer company that had previously worked on the Sinclair and the ill-fated Conic system. The Atari Panther was set to be fully completed before Flare Technology approached Atari with a new idea. They said they could make a system that was better than the 16-bit counterparts and keep costs down at the same time. This new system would be capable of handling 3D graphics. This must have been music and candy all rolled into one for Atari. The Jaguar would eventually be released on November of 1993. Some of you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits. 3DO is 32 bits. The Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Hmm? With 64 bits, 3D graphics, real world animation, and lightning speed that you can only get with Jaguar. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Can you repeat the question? Jaguar! 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 But the games for the new Atari console barely showed their graphical superiority over the 16-bit consoles. The architecture for the Jaguar was too complicated to work on or make games for, causing many developers to underutilize the power that was under the hood. But it was capable of doing much better than most of the games that it got. Not surprisingly, the Jaguar faulted and its CD add-on would barely make a dent, much less function at all if you did buy one. The Jaguar would only sell about 150,000 consoles. This right here was the nail in the coffin, the final straw for Atari. In 1996, they would discontinue all support for the Jaguar and exit the console market. With this move, Atari as a company no longer had any hardware footprint on the home console, handheld, or computer market. The Tramiel family had been wanting to leave the industry for some time, and the failure of the Jaguar was the perfect reason and time to do this. In that same year, Atari Corporation decided to merge with JTS to form JTS Corporation. At that point, a large portion of all Atari employees were let go, and Atari Interactive, which was in charge of bringing over titles to the PC market side, was shut down. Time Warner Interactive, meanwhile, wanted to sell off their Atari games portion and told management in Atari games to find a buyer. They were able to find one in WMS, WMS being a short constrictive spelling for Williams, the same company that had brought us some of the most iconic pinball and arcade cabinet. With that merger, the Atari games brand was reinstated for use once again.
The Atari brand that had started in 1972 under one name had been fragmented into various entities, Atari Corporation, Atari Games, and Atari Interactive. Each one of them held different control of Atari intellectual properties and hardware. From this point forward, it would be all about what property went where as no new dedicated Atari consoles would ever be released again. Now, stay with me here because it gets a little complicated, so let's just get started. In February 1998, MWS rebranded their video game assets and called it Midway Games. In the same year, JTS sells off its game assets to Hasbro for $5 million. Hasbro, in turn, starts to restructure its purchased property and rebrands Atari Games Corporation to Midway Games West by the end of 1999. Hasbro also released all rights to the Jaguar to the public in 1999, meaning that anyone could create games for the Jaguar without any fear of repercussions from Hasbro. By 2001, Midway Games exited the arcade side but kept producing games for the home consoles. Infogrames bought out Hasbro Interactive and the Game.com handheld for $100 million. This deal included the Atari name and properties as well as the name of Microprose and all the titles under that brand. Infogrames licensed out the Atari name and games to Ad Games and in 2004, the Atari Flashback was released to the market. It included 20 games total, 15 2600 games, and the remaining 5 being 7800 titles. It was the first Atari brand console to be released since the ill-fated Jaguar in 1993, 11 years prior. In 2008, Infogrames made its intentions to Atari that they wanted to buy out all Atari public shares. Atari agreed and by October, the deal was finalized. By 2009, Infogrames renames Infogrames Entertainment to Atari SA in order to consolidate the two names into one and avoid confusion among consumers. On January 21st, 2013, the four related companies, Atari, Atari Interactive, Humongous, and California US Holdings filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York. Now, the following excerpt is straight from Wikipedia, and I'm just going to read it off of there, so hold on tight. In July 2013, Atari began to sell its game assets, developers, and the famous Fuji logo and the Atari name in a bankruptcy auction. During the sale, the Battlezone and Moonbase Commander games were bought by Rebellion Developments. The Backyard Sports franchise was sold to Epic Gear LLC and later to Day6 Sports Group LLC. Appeal Studios acquired Outcast. Glue Mobile acquired the Deer Hunter franchise. Tomo bought Humongous Inc. and over a hundred different games, including games from the companies Accolade, Microprose, and Math Grand Prix. Nordic Games acquired the rights to Desperados and Silver. Total Annihilation and Master of Orion were sold to Wargaming. And lastly, Star Control was bought by Stardock. In 2015, Alternative Software acquired Hogs of War and Fragile Alliance and re-released them both on Steam. In December 2016, Atari sold the Test Drive franchise to Big Ben Interactive and also sold the V-Rally series to the company without a formal announcement. In 2017, Pico Interactive acquired several titles from Atari, 40 Winks, Bubble Ghost, Chamber of the Psy Mutant Priestess, Deathgate, Draken, Eternum, Glover, Monty Mole, Hostage, Rescue Mission, Marco Polo, and Timegate, Night's Chase. On September 2018, THQ Nordic announced they had acquired the Alone in the Dark franchise and Act of War. On March 3rd, 2020, Ziggurat Interactive acquired dozens of ex-Atari-owned titles, including Deadly Dozen. It was the mother of all sell-offs. Everything but the kitchen sink was sold off. But Atari SA still holds the rights to many original Atari titles many of which you see right here on this list.
Atari also comes out of bankruptcy and auctions proceedings and decides to try out a couple of new ventures. In 2017, the Atari box was teased as a new Atari product that would be running on a Linux-type ecosystem. It would eventually be renamed to the VCS and released to backers of the crowdfunding phase on December of 2020. Later, it was released to the public in June 15 of 2021. As of the making of this video, Atari had a failed venture into opening an Atari brand casino and hotel, but it did manage to create a new Atari cryptocurrency. Atari hopes this currency is used across the entertainment industry across many different platforms and not just Atari. How long this part of the business will last remains to be seen. So by now the Atari company that we knew is but a thought, a time capsule event if you will that future generations could look back upon and study and dissect for insight and knowledge. The company that Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney started at Syzygy to innovate the idea of video gaming for the arcade and home market has been long gone since the buyout in 1984 when Atari branched into Atari Corporations and Atari Games, two entities owned by two different companies but sharing the Atari name. A name that is now so fragmented that it's improbable that we will ever see all the Atari assets come under one single company ever again. So that's 50 years of Atari name being thrown around the gaming industry. What were your first memories with the Atari brand? Maybe it was a game? Maybe one of the consoles? Maybe it was one of the arcade games? Let me know in the comments below. Hopefully you enjoyed this little look back into one of the most iconic brands ever and maybe, maybe just learned a little something along the way. So stay tuned for my next video because the Atari 2600 and Atari in general is not the only console to hit a milestone this year. Stay watching, stay playing, and as always, take care of yourselves.